right, so I'd like to just say, first off, welcome and thank you for attending today's session. I recognize that it's very late in the day and uh, apparently there wasn't a lot of notice about this session, so I can tell it's the hardcore people who are here who are really interested, so thanks for joining us. Um, today's session uh, will be with Dr. Sarah Jo Nixon and it will be on treating substance abuse among prenatally exposed persons. Um, before we get going with that, I just do have um, one brief housekeeping tip, and that's just to remind you that evaluations for this session and other sessions will, are going to be mail, emailed to the participants, so be sure to sign your attendance sheet, and that will be passed around. Okay, um, next off, education and training, uh, as you all know, is a critical aspect in the Government of Alberta's FASD 10-year strategic plan, and that is addressed through various initiatives, such as the video conference learning series. So we're pleased with the ongoing interest and attendance in this initiative, and again, that's another good reason for us to ask you to fill out your, your evaluation forms. So now I have the, the pleasure of introducing Sarah Jo. Dr. Nixon is Professor, Chief of Addiction Research and Director of the Neurocognitive Laboratory uh, in the University of Florida Department of Psychiatry. She's an experienced clinical researcher in the area of substance abuse and dependence. Her research team focuses on the cognitive, psychological and social concomitants of substance misuse. Because of the complex nature of substance abuse, her work uses comprehensive assessments including neuropsychological testing, brainwave examination, as well as clinical research interviews. Dr. Nixon is the author of over 100 articles, as well as two edited books and a number of book chapters. She's made over 200 scientific presentations and held grants and awards from a, from a variety of private, state, and national sources. Additionally, she's the current president of the Research Society on Alcoholism. She's also a fellow in Divisions 50, which is Addiction, and 28, Substance Use and Psychopharmacology, for the American Psychological Association. So now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nixon. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for being such hardy participants um, through the day. I appreciate that very much. Um, and I am uh, delighted to be a part of this learning series. Um, this is really a wonderful opportunity to, to reach out, to have impact on a, a wide variety of populations, and I was delighted to have been asked to participate. I want to make sure, oh, good. Got to find this magic pointer. Um, one of the things I immediately want to say is that um, this presentation was uh, constructed with the collaboration of Lisa Merlot, who is a cognitive psychologist and an assistant professor in our department, with a particular emphasis and interest in behavioral interventions and tying those kinds of things together. So I want to thank her, and you'll see a picture of her later, and you'll go, oh, my Lord, she looks about 12. And she does look like she's about 12, but she's really not. All right, so what do we need to talk about when we look at treating substance abuse in individuals who have, of course, already been the victim of substance misuse in some way? And I, first of all, I'd like to outline um, the overall session goals. First, I think we ought to examine the traditional treatment approaches and goals. We need to identify the limitations of these approaches, particularly for the population that we're talking about, and identify some alternative approaches. I think we have to start out with the very basic assumption that one size does not fit all. So let's start with the uh, traditional approaches. Um, the traditional approach is, is more or less a 12-step approach. And Alcoholic Anonymous um, sort of personifies that approach. It isn't the only 12-step approach that's out there, but it is the one most commonly used. And then we're going to look at brain changes and their impact on whether or not these 12-step programs are the most, uh, most appropriate for our populations, and then assess the fit between the approach and the person in need. So um, I would also welcome, I'm not sure um, whether or not we can take questions from the floor during the midst of this. We can't? Great. If you all have questions, the only thing that I would ask you to do is to jump up and down because there's a very bright light in my eyes and I can't see anyone on that side of the room. But jump up and down and, and we'll be able to hear you making noise in the event that you have a question. So let's talk about Alcoholics Anonymous. All right. First, we're going to talk about what AA is and what it isn't. Okay? Sometimes there are, are a lot of misunderstandings amongst um, the population about what AA is, and it gets over-defined um, or over-generalized in terms of what it's actually set up to do. We'll identify the 12 steps, 
what this progression is, um, the fact of um, the role of the big book in, in, a, in a larger population and, in fact, worldwide impact, and then how that fits with individuals who have, um, who have been prenatally exposed to alcohol. In its own words, I think it's important to recognize several, several things. First of all, AA is a fellowship of individuals who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. So what, some of the key areas are this issue of fellowship, sharing, common problem identity with a community, and a focus on service. We'll come back to that. There are no dues or fees and self-supporting uh, through own contributions. It's not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, and does not wish to engage in any controversy. Neither endorses nor opposes any causes. So they're apolitical. Now, this, is, this could be a whole other lecture on, on our difficulty in understanding the process of recovery within AA because there is a real um, sensitivity to the issues of confidentiality as an individual and for the larger community. So it's made understanding the process of recovery and whether or not what will and won't work um, a little difficult. Finally, the primary purpose is to say, stay sober and help other al alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Again, a major emphasis on what? On service and on community. Well, what it isn't, as I've already said, it is not, it is not uh, political. It has no doctrines, dogma, or, or standard protocol. It is not a manual-driven recovery program. It is a program of attraction. And part of its great success is that, again, accepting persons of all types of belief and background. It offers a suggested program of recovery with the idea of centering on a desire to stop drinking. Now, when we take these general overviews or outlines for AA and begin looking at um, how they're implemented, that's what we need to focus on next, is how are these basic beliefs and assumptions actually implemented? What are those 12 steps? First, we've admitted we were powerless, our lives are unmanageable, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, and we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to God as we understood him, or her, as the case may be. So those are the first three. Notice what they're focusing on. We've admitted powerlessness. Lives are unmanageable. There's a power greater. There's a capacity to abstract and to identify at a level greater than oneself and one's abilities, and made a decision to turn will and lives over. The fourth, fifth, and sixth are made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, admitted to God, ourselves, and another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs, and we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Finally, seven, eight, and nine. Humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all, made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure themselves or others. And finally, continued. This is an ongoing process of taking personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him or her, praying only for knowledge of their will for us and the power to carry that out. And then finally, number 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. So what is this program? What are these 12 steps really focusing on? What do they require 
of an individual to successfully negotiate these 12 steps. First of all, steps one through three, admission and acceptance of powerlessness over alcohol, an understanding and willingness to understand that unmanageability of life, and a surrender of will. Steps four through 10 focus on a self-examination, on making amends and restitution, that is being able to operate again within a larger community to deal with uh, perceived and actual wrongs. And then finally, steps 11 and 12, service. So what are we asking and, and what the, why has this book been so successful? And why is this, this program actually very successful? It is not, by the way, treatment. It is a program of recovery, and I think we need to be very clear about that. So when we talk about treatment for individuals who have been exposed to alcohol prenatally, one of the things we often do is suggest they go to treatment. Most, not all, but most programs are built around a 12-step orientation. And that means that to successfully complete that treatment endeavor, that treatment period, these 12 steps in some part have to be addressed. Now, <clears throat> it's been enormously um, effective in a variety of community settings. But why might this not work so well for individuals who have been exposed to alcohol prenatally? First of all, I want, um, if we're going to fit it to the population we're most interested in today, we have to realize that the fitting it requires a capacity for successful interpersonal relationships. It requires a capacity to review actions and consider impact on others both in the present and in the past. A capacity to engage abstract concepts of community, of God, and will effectively. And a capacity for self-disclosure and to hold self accountable to others through community. That's a high level of cognitive capacity. To be able to make these plans, to do the introspection, to be able to make a list of the, of the wrongs you've done to someone else, on and on, requires a capacity to utilize the frontal lobes, the brain as a whole, in a way that individuals who have any kind of uh, frontal lobe damage, attentional deficits, et cetera, are going to find somewhat difficult. And in some cases, it doesn't fit at all. So we have to understand that our traditional approaches rely on, fund on the, on the uh, assumption that the fundamental systems and, and capabilities are intact. So where does that leave us? We know that fetal alcohol exposure, and let's call it FASD for tonight, um, is indeed has a brain effect that we know that it is um, associated with a variety of neurobehavioral changes. We have folks who want to believe it's about being lazy or not interested or not ready to change. But the reality is that this alcohol exposure has very significant effects in a variety of neurocognitive functions, which directly affect the capacity to operate within the 12-step modality. So what I'd like to do next is um, talk a little bit about the brain abnormalities, the white matter abnormalities um, in particular. I'd like to move some of this to a neuropsychological um, testing environment and look at the reality of conceptual skills, which are essential for effective 12-step um, integration. Two particular uh, kinds of uh, conceptual tests that we can look at. And then look at some deficits and then what does that mean? So they don't do something very, very well. What does that mean? All right? So here is a, a very nice picture of a six-year-old who has fetal alcohol um, uh, spectrum disorder. I about ate that mic. Um, and here you will see enlarged ventricles, small brain, enlarged sulci, 
Here you see um, on the right-hand side in figure two, you see a, a large uh, vacuous area at the back of the brain. And basically, you see um, a generalized, all over, um, atrophy. Except in this case, it's not atrophy because it never actually developed. This is obviously brain damage. Oftentimes, what we see in individuals who have been prenatally exposed to alcohol, however, isn't this obvious. And one of the things is that very often, if you look at their MRIs, just in terms of the structural integrity, they, they look pretty normal. They certainly don't look as disrupted as their behavior would lead you to believe. Fortunately, and um, we're beginning to get better measures, and this is a data from a study that uh, Gail Andrew and her group did here. And it doesn't really, the, the specific letters aren't important. Here's what's important. They looked at the white matter tracks in the brain. And the white matter tracks are, of course, the areas that carry information back and forth. They ensure the integrity of the communication from the anterior to posterior and vice versa, from the left to the right. Those are the, the, the things that make sure that information gets transported and utilized effectively. Notice that when they... Um, when they did this study, the green ones are, are the only white tracks, I mean, are, are the only white matter tracks that don't show deficits in terms of either the diffusion or the FA. And those are just measures of white track integrity. Are they, are they functioning as they should? Are they transmitting information um, linearly? How much diffusion of that is going out? Notice that. Here, the blues and the reds and the yellows are all white matter tracts that are compromised um, in fetal alcohol exposure. That's a pretty significant take home. Because if you have this level of disruption in the brain, the areas that are supposed to be able to take the information and get it to where it needs to go, you can see that the capacity to integrate information, to be able to uh, self-assess to be able to review impact on others is going to be significantly compromised. Now, I'm going to move it from this sort of structural piece to a functional piece and use some tests that are well known in neuropsychology. So that there are, um, there are many, but there are two well-known tests of conceptual skills, the Wisconsin card sorting test and in the card sorting test uh, done by Dellis and Kaplan. And they actually look at conceptual uh, skills in slightly different ways, so that to use them both provides really a complementary way of looking at a, a wide range or spectrum of conceptual um, activation. So <clears throat> um, McGee and colleagues were able to take some prenatally exposed some had FAS, some didn't, group, and a group of controls. And you can see that the mean age was 11. And, and their IQ for the controls was um, a mean of about 107 with a standard deviation of, of 12. That should say plus and minus. An alcohol-exposed group with an IQ of 89 plus or minus 12. So we're talking about high-functioning individuals in general in terms of the fetal exposure. <clears throat> So what did they find? Well, first of all, let's talk about what the task involves. For those of you who might not be familiar with this, um, basically an individual um, is asked to sort cards. And they're given a set of cards, as you see here, and unfortunately my pointer has, cooked, has died. But, and they're given um, a stack of cards and asked to sort them. But that's the only instruction that they're given. And you could, you could sort these by color or form or number, right? But they don't know what the rule is. And every time, if they sort it correctly, which is determined by the experimenter, right, then um, a nice little beep happens. However, if they sort them incorrectly, a horrible Wah! kind of sound happens to remind them that that wasn't right. But they are not redirected. So you can see that some of the issues have to do with how quickly do they shift once they're given negative feedback 
Once they're told that's not right, how quickly can they shift to a new strategy? Or do they just persist or perseverate with the same strategy? Furthermore, of all the categories that can happen, you can do it by color, by form, or by number, how quickly can they get all of them? Okay. So sensitivity to feedback, ability to set shift, ability to see the alternatives in front of them. If not this, then what? Okay. So very key parts of the Wisconsin card sorting test. The California card sorting test is um, actually a bit more interesting, no offense to the Wisconsin card sorting test, but you get to do things with this test that you don't get to do with the, with the Wisconsin. So for instance, you can see these are the stimuli over here, and um, they are shapes, they are colors, and they have labels on them. And basically, you can give them free sorts so that an individual just has to sort them as many different ways as they can. Or you can give them directed sorts. Okay. So the, um, the key is how many can they do on their own? How many options within this group do they see? Furthermore, if I give them direction, you could do it by shape. How effectively will they implement that direction? So you can see that the, the two kinds of card sorting tests really together provide a very nice overview of how people can set shift, how, whether or not they perseverate, can they take the cues in front of them, and how self-determined can they be in their problem-solving ability. So what did McGee et al. find? Oh, more options. All right. This is pretty straightforward. The individuals who were alcohol exposed did more poorly. You know, that kind of approach um, that is saying they did more poorly really doesn't tell us much about how to intervene in that process. It tells us about a gross deficit and doesn't break it down into pieces that we can teach problem-solving skills in or teach skill substitution. So for instance, in terms of set shifting, the individuals who had been exposed to alcohol prenatally had fewer categories that they were able to achieve. When they were told it was wrong, they perseverated in continuing this incorrect thing. It's like, you know, did it wrong before, I don't know how to integrate that feedback. I don't know what to do. You're telling me it's wrong, but I'm perseverating. Incorporating direction, um, they actually had a few uh, uh, reduced ability to execute directed sorts. Now that's a little bit um, interesting, I thought, to find that, and that even in the directed sorts, that is, do it this way, they were unable to successfully do that. And finally, um, a part of the uh, California is, is that they have to verbalize the principles that they imposed. What was the direction of? How did you come to that? And they were less able to do so. Now, <clears throat> from a clinical perspective, we now have to say, well, hmm, we know that there's demonstrable brain damage. We know even in individuals who don't have significant cortical atrophy or lack of development, we have white, white matter tract deficiencies. And now we know that behaviorally, in individuals who have IQs of about 89, we see a significant um, inadequacy in the capacity to solve problems through concepts. This should tell us a lot about whether or not individuals are going to be able to effectively navigate the process of the 12 steps. So what these deficits, what, what do they translate to? What's meaningful if you're trying to look at individuals and say, huh, they don't sort those into as many piles? What's the impact of that? What's the real world implication? And there are several. First of all, they're unable to see the alternatives. That is, they go, what choice? 
I don't see a choice in front of me. I did this. I'm continuing to do this. Second, I told you that wasn't going to work, we may say to them, through that negative little beep again and again, or by directing them in the sorts, and we don't see an appropriate response so that they're unable to change behavior even when they're told it isn't effective. Finally, they're unable to integrate and act on concepts even when they're provided by others, such as, I think you might. And finally, and I, I, um, this is, is most frustrating and is very common to uh, conditions which involve any kind of frontal uh, damage, I have a stepson who's 14, and he has Down syndrome, and he lives with us full time. And um, why we ever ask him why, I do not really know, okay? Because it gets us absolutely nowhere. Why did you do that? And it's like a deer in the headlights. Well, I sh um, you know, it doesn't, there's not a capacity often to respond to that question why. And we find the same kind of deficit in individuals who've been pre -exposed or, or prenatally exposed to alcohol. So these are key issues. When you start looking at, gee, how am I going to impact the substance use in these individuals, and you're confronted with deficits in the capacity to use these kinds of questions, suddenly your orientation needs to be shifted. You need to see the reality of the limits in processing this information, including the feedback that they get. So um, what do we do? What do we do? The 12-step program, while effective in a number of populations in terms of providing a community of support, a program, not a treatment of recovery, relies heavily on the capacity to do what? Abstract, to have empathy, to be able to deal as a community, and to be able to hold oneself accountable. And yet we've seen that we can't very well do things like respond to why did you do that or I told you that wasn't going to work or what choice was there so what can we do how can we what do we need to be focused on to provide effective or at least more effective intervention in these cases how is it that we need to organize ourselves and our um, service delivery systems to better meet this need one of the things that we um, can, can, can consider are these contingency management kinds of approaches. The, the idea that there is a direct and immediate outcome associated with any particular behavior of interest. Of course, we have to consider some caveats regarding that. We have to work specifically with various um, behavioral contingencies. And we're going to talk at length, and I hope you all will help me, in this section on identifying observable behaviors, identifying meaningful outcomes, and applying contingencies consistently. So let's go to the first one. What do we mean by contingency management? And Steve Higgins and others have done a number of studies where they've actually looked at contingency management in a larger community setting so that individuals who had substance use uh, problems were actually held accountable through um, to, to um, achieve abstinence with the following sort of basic three steps. First, they had to provide a urine sample. Second, it had to be negative. Third, they got a reward. And they used this in, the, in a uh, general community to reduce particularly um, drug use. The idea was that these individuals, these were adults, um, would participate in this program, and for this, they might get money, um, they might get access to various services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are a number of issues related to this, and we're, and we're going to talk about some of them. But notice a direct relationship between clean urine and reward. Okay? With alcohol, it's obviously not so easy. First of all, the urine screens are very ill-timed, typically. Um, and the second is that alcohol has a unique place in society in general. 
and it isn't illegal. So we have to, we face a, a slightly different set of community questions when we look at alcohol use. Furthermore, notice that here, the individual has to have in mind the idea that I've got to have this in order to get this negative test, in order to get this reward. Okay. So there are multiple steps, although there's a strong contingency, there are multiple steps in imposing that contingency. So <clears throat> often in contingency management protocols, um, they're, sh they're rather short. They're often 12-week programs that are developed to say, I want you to learn to be clean sober. And over this 12-week period, we're going to give you rewards when you have clean urines. And when you don't have clean urines, we're going to not only not give you a, a reward, but we may reset the clock. So for instance, if you have to have one clean urine, fine. You don't have one, nothing happens, and you don't get the reward. But you build up over time the number of clean urines required in order to have a reward. You should already be seeing the problems that could happen in the kind of population that we're talking about. So you have to have, now you have to have three clean urines. So you have three clean urines, great, you get your reward. But what happens when the third one is not clean? Two were, one wasn't. Well, it resets the clock so that they have to start all over again. So that is a pretty effective incentive to individuals who don't have brain damage. It might not work and doesn't work as well for individuals who do. So the idea is that in this 12-week period, in these contingency management protocols, in these plans, the locus of control, the who is in charge of providing the reward, shifts from an externalizing kind of approach, that is, they give me the reward, to an internalizing one. The idea being that they assume responsibility, that the self-efficacy and capacity to do so is rewarding in and of itself, and that they then maintain sobriety. Now, I can't see most of your faces, given the lighting in here, but I would imagine that most of you are going, how is that going to work? How is that going to work with individuals who have substance use and have what? Prenatal exposure to alcohol and that we know have existing brain damage. What are we going to do? So we have to, um, as we have heard in the last couple of days of, of talks, we have to adapt the plan. And we have to adapt the plan with careful attention to each of the individuals who are a part or who need that plan. So the idea that we could simply impose a contingency management um, approach as they have used with fairly normal alcohol and drug users in general communities to our population of interest is, um, well, first of all, probably inaccurate, but also pretty much a waste of time. Because we already know that given the problem-solving skills, what are we going to need to do? It can't be an abstract outcome. It can't be something that's delayed horribly in time. And we need to be very clear what the expectations are. So, <clears throat> as I've already alluded to, this concept of shifting from internal, uh, externalizing to internalizing control may not be possible for all clients. The reliance also on only on withholding behavior, I mean reward, I'm so sorry, uh, reward may not be sufficient to deter behavior. Now that doesn't mean, and I want to be very clear, that they should have shock collars on, okay? That's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about the fact that sometimes um, just not giving something positive may not be that rewarding if an individual has, for instance, attention deficit disorder on top of everything else and quickly shifts attention to something else. There's no long-term effect of not getting that reward. Okay? 
The other thing is that um, increasing the number of runs, and I made uh, mention of this also, that is increasing the fixed ratio for reward must be carefully evaluated. Okay. Um, you know, when we talk about behavior modification, we talk about the schedules of reinforcement. We, we talk about doing it on fixed um, interval, that is on time, and we talk about doing it by fixed ratio. The, the um, example I've been providing has to do with a fixed ratio schedule. Every time you bring a clean urine, you'll get a reward. That's a one. However, as you increase that ratio, which in the real world we all have to learn to do in order to get by, that is, you're not going to get paid every day at the end of work. If you do, I want your job. Okay. Um, instead, we, um, but we need to be sensitive to the fact that this increasing the number of required runs or, you know, successful completions really has to be thought of within a larger context. It isn't just about, and I'm going to give you some examples of, of that in just a minute, but it isn't just the number of of breath tests that are negative or urine tests that are negative, et cetera. That just simply um, won't cover the context that we have to address. So what do we need to do? We've talked a lot about what we probably isn't very effective to do. What should we focus on? First of all, we have to identify observable behaviors. Now, that seems very straightforward. But the 12-step program is often built on the capacity to what? Self-monitor, to self-report, to be willing to say, I used, I slipped, I had a lapse. Okay? We ought not to rely on something that abstract when we are treating special populations who have brain damage. We need to be able to identify observable behaviors that are observable by others in order to effectively intervene in a behavioral cycle. The other thing is that we have to identify meaningful outcomes. Okay. Um, you know, what's meaningful for, for John may not be meaningful for Mary. These have to be individualized approaches that we take. And finally, we have to apply the contingencies consistently. Now, that's the same in any kind of behavioral in intervention, but it becomes particularly important when individuals have a difficult time ferreting out what the rules are in this context versus that context. So, what are we talking about? What are observable behaviors that might have to do with substance use? The, as I was thinking about this, I thought about the, the following kind of context. You have, um, you have a client who walks to work every morning. They walk to work, um, and on their way to work, they pass a convenience store, a liquor store. They're tempted because they know what they can get in there, particularly since they, they do get paid a portion every day. And so they get to work fine. But getting home, what do you think happens? They're distracted by the liquor store. They have a little money in their pocket. And what happens? They go in. And when they go in, somebody's friendly to them the clerk who knows them, that has seen them for years, and they have an interaction. They have a, a social engagement that makes your client feel very important, quite capable. They can actually pay for it themselves, and they buy a drink. They buy a bottle. They buy a can of beer. doesn't matter. They drink that one, and then they have another one, and maybe they have another two. And then they have to go ahead and get home. And by the time they get home, they're, they're, let's say that they're living still in the family unit. And um, the family says, what'd you do today? What do you think they did that day? They went to work. They came home. 
They stopped and saw John at the store. Okay? And there they are. What do we have to do to appropriately intervene in that? Is it, a, is it sufficient, for instance, to say, I'll call him Joe. Joe, I don't want you to stop at that liquor store. Why isn't that effective? It's too abstract, but not only is it too abstract, when does it happen in time? Okay, when does it happen in time? Hours later, after going to work, after getting the money, and now needing to return home. So you've got a huge delay between the statement of what is expected and when it might even happen. The other thing is that um, obviously if you're um, persuasive enough, let us say, um, you're going to convince Joe that he didn't go to the store even though he did. Because he's going to know he's going to be in trouble. But did you walk home with him? No. Did anybody walk home with him? Probably not. So when he says, no, I didn't, I really didn't, I didn't stop there, how can you ensure that that isn't the truth? That he didn't stop there. He stopped someplace else. Okay? These, when we talk about observable behaviors, it's not just something like watching. It means I don't want you to stop at Joe's. And how are you going to implement that? So from a community and a context issue, there are several issues that have to be thought about. First, is there another way for him to get to work? Okay, if the problem is stopping at Joe's, let's don't have him go by Joe's anymore. Okay? That's very straightforward if indeed there is another way to get there that's safe, convenient, and time effect, you know. Okay? So one of those things is who are you going to have to engage to apply such a plan? Do, 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 do. That's my little Jeopardy song. So who are you going to have to engage? You're going to have to engage the store owner. Now you're saying, well, he ought to be able to do that himself. No, not with this kind of brain damage. Not when I can't see the next option. Okay? Those kinds of alternatives are not going to occur over time without additional engagement of folks who see the actual behavior. Now, I had this problem even with my... <clears throat> my 24-year-old son, who's, who I conveniently always believed that he actually lost his homework. Did you take it to school? No, I lost it. Or, this was even better, did you take it to school? Oh, yeah, I did well. Okay, so why the week before graduation am I told you might not graduate? He did win the award for the most creative excuses for not handing in his homework. I was so proud. <clears throat> All right, bottom line is you have to have someone observe that behavior and be willing to intervene at the point at which it might occur. So when we talk about doing these treatments, when we talk about intervening, we have to be very concrete. Not just concrete like, I don't want you to stop at Joe's, but how am I going to monitor whether or not you're stopping at Oh, I guess it was John's. Joe's our client. The other thing is that we have to understand the larger context, and that's why I brought up the reality that when, that when um, Joe comes in to this store, he's greeted. He's important. He counts. The stuff that happened earlier at work when somebody called him stupid, when somebody said, how come you don't have that done yet? Don't you even know what you're doing? I can't believe they hired somebody like you. That all goes away when given this social, unconditional acceptance. That's a pretty significant motivator. That incentive is, is very high. 
And now you have the emotional component of the social environment in which the drinking occurs, as well as the alcohol itself. So it's no wonder that we don't, that it, it's so hard to find a way to intervene. We can't be with our clients all the time. We hope that we'll set out some goals, they'll agree to those goals, and we'll mosey on. But you can't do that when the, the brain will not allow you to, to organize that information into a larger whole because that's what conceptual learning is all about. Making a bigger hole out of these little, I mean hole, you know, like W-H, not hole, like dig a hole. Right, are you there? Okay, so we have to be, um, we have to be well aware of the fact that that capacity is not there. We have to provide the pieces. We need not to count on there ever being a larger hole. That's not what we can count on. In normal development, we always plan on in the next step, this kind of brain development is going to allow X or Y. It's gonna allow you to grow in your capacity to take in information, to integrate it meaningfully, and to see beyond oneself. All of our, um, I can't say all, much of our parenting, much of our educational system, much of our interventions are, are sort of geared around the belief that we're approaching what Piaget called as formal operations. We're gonna be able to do that abstracting. And when we, we apply that bias or that prejudice on this kind on, on treatment, we miss the boat sometimes. So we have to be concrete, we have to know the context, and we have to engage the community. Now, engaging the community. Um, you've heard a lot um, in the last couple of days about the importance of the community networks, about wraparound services, about a continuity of care, and guess what? This kind of treatment is the same. We have to have a continuity, we have to have open communication, and we have to be willing to take some risks that we um, often don't take in our treatment of substance abuse. And by that, I mean that we have to engage the help of community members, of significant others, of uh, workplace um, supervisors and workmates, et cetera. And that gets a little tricky because first of all, that supervisor doesn't have time to watch what Joe does on his break, okay? Furthermore, that supervisor doesn't want to. They've got too many other things to do. It is not their job to babysit. And that's true, it isn't. But one of the accommodations that we in the workplace have to be willing to consider is the reality that not only might we have to look at hours differently, not only might we have to look at issues of uh, timing and report dues and things like that a little with more flexibility, but we also have to be willing to assume a slightly different role in lives. And that means that sometimes that, that we have to be sensitive to issues which negatively impact their performance in the workplace as being something bigger than they're having a bad day. So we absolutely have to integrate these sort of three C's as we look at the various behavioral indices and the various behavioral outcomes that we can actually look at. In terms of meaningful outcomes, um, you know, the 30-day the coin might not be all that meaningful to an individual with, um, with brain damage. What does that mean? So I got, I, I went 30 days, good for me, I've got 30 days of sobriety. Even sobriety is often an abstract term because we talk about not drinking and then we talk about being sober. And sometimes we talk about them very differently. Sobriety is a way of life, not drinking is an activity. 
And one of the things that we have to do when we're working on treatment plans and orientations for these folks is that we really need to be sensitive to that. We need to be sensitive to the fact that sobriety in and of itself may be something in an abstract term that they cannot achieve. Not drinking is a behavior. Not drinking is linked to specific outcomes and changes in behavior. So the other thing, um, context specific, where, when, how. We, um, we were just talking about the idea of how does that individual get to work? If they walk by this den of iniquity every day, why do we expect that the behavior is going to change? What can we do to impact that? Now, rituals, order, habits are terribly important to organize our own lives um, as well as those with um, any kind of brain damage. And so changing the way they get to work might not be your best option. Inter talking with or, or meeting John, the store owner, on the other hand, might be. Now, if you're a family member, that may be fairly, or maybe not a family member, but if you're a significant player in Joe's life, that may be easier for you to do. If you're the therapist who is just seeing them on a weekly basis or even twice a week, you've got some other issues. So the reality is that this treatment is going to necessarily engage more than only the individual who is, has a problem with alcohol or other drugs. So we have to be able to come up with a reward, an outcome associated with non-drinking that is meaningful to that individual. That's always the case. But, you know, sometimes these can be very concrete. They, I mean, very simple and concrete. It might be buying a movie, getting a DVD. Okay? It might not be something abstract like earning points toward a Lord only knows what. Okay? But if we make it concrete and make it meaningful, then it has an impact. You heard this talked about in the last couple of days as well, the idea of um, can learning therapies be, uh, be um, applied in these individuals? And the reality is, yeah, yeah, they can, but they have to be adapted. They have to be meaningful, they have to be immediate, and they have to be consistently applied. So <clears throat> can we do it? Sure we can. Do we have to know something about our client? Absolutely. What do they really like to do? With my stepson, I, I, I can get him to do almost anything if it means that he gets a new DVD movie. Okay? Now, is that man manipulative on my part? Mm. Yes. It is. Because I'm trying to ensure that he develops skills that keep him safe, maximize his potential, and teach him a little bit about the reality of the outside world, which is the world is not unconditional. And so when we deal with these issues, we have to indeed focus on a material reward. Context specific, we keep coming back to that because the reward may also be context specific. What works in the home or in one environment as a means of reward may not work for instance, in the workplace, okay? So that, for instance, if one of our objectives is to make sure that Joe doesn't show up at work drunk, we need to do something about making sure that when he gets there and he isn't, that that's immediately recognized. It can't wait till the end of the day when they get home. That delay, that interference of all the other things that happen in the day destroy the continuity of the demand and the reward. So each step has to be, if going towards is a problem, it has to be rewarded on the other end. If coming home is a problem, it has to be rewarded on the end. If both of them are problems, you've got to address both of them. Um, I, again, we can't count on the idea that everything's going to go fine. So for instance, let's say that they um, go to work, and they had a drink on the way to work. 
and they didn't get their reward. The, the uh, supervisor noticed it. So whatever the reward was, whatever it is, they didn't get. And then they come home, and they didn't drink on the way home. So this is eight hours later. They didn't drink on the way home. And then what happens? What does, let's just say, mom, what does mom say? Did you, get, did you get your reward today on the way to work? I mean, when you got to work, and what does Joe say? Yeah. Did Joe? No. Okay. So if we don't have communication between the various parties involved in implementing the contingencies, they will surely fail. There must be clear expectations of this communication. There has to be a clear timing of it. Um, there has to be an openness and understanding that this information is going to be obtained as well. So this requires that we somehow engage our clients with these problems in a way that they understand they have a problem and these folks are here to help them with it. It's not a punitive. It's not you're being watched. It's that look what this has done, except what do we have there? Do we have a capacity necessarily to see all the negative outcomes? Only if they're very high functioning. So the community, the context, the realities of the community responsibilities, and finally what? Monitoring and reminders. We do this anytime we're um, trying to teach someone a new skill. So if we're trying to teach them a new lab technique, if I'm trying to teach someone how to put the cap on and do the electrophysiological measures of brain activity, et cetera, what do I do? I monitor, I double check, I periodically check, I remind them about what the expectations are and what we want to have done. It is labor intensive and providing um, adequate treatment for individuals who have prenatal alcohol exposure and subsequent brain damage is also labor intensive because it necessarily engages all of these factors that we've talked about identifying material rewards which may change with time okay um, what what um, Daniel has always liked movies, but for a while you could get by with um, really cheap little plastic toys, you know. That doesn't work anymore. Okay, no cheap plastic toys. But movies still work. So there are developmental changes that happen. You have to be sensitive to those. Um, and, and I want to bring this up because I think we forget that um, the brain continues to develop. There is the opportunity for developmental change for, um, in a positive way, I mean, um, you know, through the 20s. And there's, there's even more than that when you start talking about the capacity to integrate information. However, many of these kids and young adults and teens that we see for treatment not only have had this pre-exposure, but have started drinking young, when they're quite young. So now we have the alcohol use on a developing brain, in a developing brain, that doesn't have the same capacity as a normal brain. So although we really need to um, consider and con the reality of continued developmental change, we also have to see it within a somewhat restricted capacity. Now, apply con contingencies consistently. Um, best laid plans of mice and men, right? How many of you all are so consistent in the way you raise your children that nobody would ever wonder, did the same rules apply? Right, yeah, okay, it's very hard to do. We say things like, if if it occurs to us, if it occurs to us, we say something like, well, it'll be okay this time. Or I'll let you off the hook this time. Or, okay, I understand why that would have happened. Don't worry about that. But next time. Now, all of those, 
all of those responses may be perfectly appropriate in some settings. And I want to believe that every time I've done it, it's been very appropriate. What are you talking about? Okay. But when you're talking and working with an individual who will not, cannot, because of brain damage, and, and really this could be but for a lot of reasons besides just fetal alcohol exposure, but fetal alcohol exposure specifically, um, that kind of capacity to learn to judge, okay, they let me off, but they never will let me off again, and really understand that, really isn't there. To them, you've changed the rules. Of course, my 24-year-old acts that way anyway, so, okay? Obviously, since he barely graduated from high school. But, you know, he did win that trophy. I'm so proud. All right. So one of the issues is that we have to set up systems that can be implemented consistently all the time, every day. Don't develop a system that can't be implemented. You know, one of the things I tell my dissertation students, I, and they want to do some great dissertation that's going to solve all of life's questions about brain function, and I said, you know what? The bottom line about a dissertation is that it's got to be doable. It will not matter how brilliant it is if it never can get done. And the same thing applies here. These have to be doable plans. If you don't have any um, cooperation from John, the store owner, don't count on John. And don't count on using a plan that allows Joe to walk to school or walk to work by himself. Yes. Oh, absolutely. How do you um, engage and sustain and assure that those things are happening? Um, there is no perfect way. Okay? There is no perfect way. Um, but people are more responsive to the demands placed upon them when they've been fully educated about what is actually going on. So, and this goes back to being advocates. So when we provide clinical services, we are advocates. And we then have to serve in that capacity to educate those that need to be engaged, enlisting their service, but not only enlisting their service, but monitoring their follow through. And sometimes that comes in, in the form of um, uh, feedback, paper feedback that's provided every day, or, um, or spot checks, as the case may be, or um, I, things that, um, that you can actually track in terms of with, with email and computers and the rest of it, it's, it's much easier. But, you know, I've seen people rely on uh, happy face. I mean, you know, any number of things that say, look, they did this part of it, whatever they do. But you can never ensure that all the time. You're not there all the time. And the, uh, the um, importance, the critical nature of their role really has to be, really has to be impressed upon them to make that happen all the time. All right, so these contingencies have to be observable. That gets back to your question in a way because not only is the behavioral obser but behavior observable, but the contingency is, if then you get this. And um, the idea is also that this inappropriate behavior has to be linked to outcomes in all settings. Now, we don't have that kind of control. But if the idea is that individuals are being asked to abstain from alcohol because they have a substance use problem, it's not okay to drink while they're at the volleyball game. It's not okay on alternate full moons on a Wednesday every other month to drink. The same, the same contingencies that apply on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday have to apply on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And this is particularly important for individuals with these problems in conceptual level thinking. So 
we have to make sure and try to impress upon the situation, really, a way to monitor behavior across environments. That is really, really tough. Work is easy compared to social environments. Okay. So one of the things that sometimes has to be, um, well, that's a critical part often in treatment for substance abuse is what? New friends, new places. And what is particularly hard for individuals with brain damage? New things, new places. You can see that this is not, while it would appear easy to say, well, we're going to do behavioral contingencies and they're going to get a reward when they don't use and that's going to be great. You know, it, it's much tougher. It's much tougher than doing sort of a talk therapy. I want you to be, uh, you know, I want you to be accountable for your behavior. I want you to think about what this is going to mean. Here you're saying, I have a community of persons that's going to help me not drink. And that means that a whole community of individuals has to be called in to help with that process. Now, the both costs and rewards, I, I want to I go to this because I know that, and I made mention of this in an earlier slide, the fact that we, we want to reward. We tend to not want to place a cost on things um, we just want to deny the reward sort of thing, right? Um, that's sort of an abstract concept in a way. Now, because people can talk around it. Um, not always is assigning a cost to a violation of a, of a behavioral expectation a negative thing. And I, I say that because I know that most learning theorists say don't do that. Punishment doesn't work. Punishment can work when it is there to keep a person safe. In other words, you're not asking them to integrate in a larger area, but if they do this, if, they, if, a, if your child crossed the road without looking, right, what did you say? Oh, well, car hit you, you know, mm. Guess you won't get your reward today. No, of course not. Well, drinking for these individuals is sort of like being hit by a car. And so sometimes, not only do we have to provide a reward, but we have to have a real cost associated with a transgression that is life-threatening. Now, what would that be? It depends. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a little manual that said, and the costs will be, and the rewards will be, and then you'll get, you know, um, but it doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work that way because we're all individuals. And what's a cost to me isn't going to be a cost to someone else. Even, even in a fully functioning brain, which you may doubt that I have right now, and I'm kind of wondering myself. But the reality is that we have to be very aware of the individual differences and the fact that sometimes not only are we the bearers of reward, which is where we really like to be, but we have to impose restrictions based on violations associated with this very unhealthy and perhaps life-threatening behavior. Now, this goes back. Uh, our first slide on contingency management, I think, said something that oftentimes it's time limited, 12 weeks. You go from externalizing to internalizing. Everything's groovy. That's not really the way it's going to work for this, for this population. It may not be a time limited. In fact, most of the time, it's not going to be a time limited intervention that begins on March the 1st and ends on May the 30th. First of all, there will be a number of false starts. There's going to be a number of times where it works, doesn't work, we forget the rules, our community partners don't help us out 
like we hoped they would. Therefore, we have a failure to enforce or reward the appropriate behavior. Therefore, on and on and on. So you see the sort of cascade of things that can go awry. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, as I mentioned before, it's an ongoing monitoring. This boss is probably going to have to be involved with Joe's sobriety or not drinking for a very long time. Maybe not forever, but for a very long time. And then the other thing is that within this framework, um, the emphasis is on, on working within a system to alter specific behaviors. Not, and by that I mean you're not altering, you're not working within the system to achieve, quote, sobriety. That's an abstract concept. You're working within the system to keep him from drinking at John's on the way to work and home. Okay. Very identifiable issues. It might be with a group of friends. It might be, you know, on who knows exactly when this behavior comes. But you will know. Working with these clients, you'll know. You'll, you know, develop that rapport. You'll know what's going on in their lives and where it is that they seem to be getting caught up in this alcohol and how to best define the communities that need to be engaged and the process of assessment. Um, I, I made mention of this before, and that is obviously this plan has to be reviewed periodically. I mean, you don't make a treatment plan and never revisit it. Well, at least you're not supposed to make a treatment plan and never revisit it. Right? In my earlier life, before I, I um, went to graduate school, um, I was a social worker. And of course, and that was in the state of Texas, which is, as you probably know, well below Oklahoma, my home state. And no, I don't have an accent. But bottom line is that, you know, you get very busy. You get busy. You have more than one client, more than one individual who needs your attention. And it's very easy to think, well, you know, the development is slowed. The brain doesn't work so well. We're not seeing these changes in terms of behavioral development, social extensions, et cetera. Maybe I don't need to revisit that. Yes, do. Because even if that individual has not changed in a dramatic way, chances are the support system has. The manager at work has changed. Somebody has moved in and out of the family. They've transitioned to um, a, a, a you know, group home environment. Um, lots of things can happen. So even though you think, I don't really need to revisit this again, please do. Because these programs, this style of intervention won't work, as I said before, unless every party is online and unless you are tracking how those are changing. And it probably won't occur to um, Joe to tell you that his supervisor changed. And probably won't for sure if he managed to get by with drinking one day because the new supervisor didn't know what he was doing. So you have to be very aware of the fact that as, as, the, um, as the advocate for these persons, we have to really be aware of a larger community and to do assessments based not just on the client's developmental changes, or, but the changes in the larger community. So um, I would love to take some questions and um, talk a bit about any specific issues that you all may have or questions that you may have. I appreciate you all staying um, through this really long couple of days, um, but I would um, really welcome your questions at this time. in a correctional setting, so they're on uh, parole in the community, yep. so there are conditions of parole which are very specific, one of them being abstain from alcohol and drugs if your conviction was related to your use of substances. So we're, we're very specific on what the consequence needs to be if one of the conditions of your parole is violated, although we have room for some maneuverability if the, the safety factor is managed. Right. But just wondering with this population and you know, sort of it's the balancing of the two, what's in the best interest of the client and then balancing the parole and the public safety piece, which because we know 
with some of the clients that their risk becomes elevated and then that puts public safety at risk. So how do, what some of your thoughts on how to balance the two? Yeah. Um, that, that's always an issue of how do I balance the rights and the developmental limitations, et cetera, et cetera, against a system that says, you know, if you do this, this is going to happen. Um, and fortunately, um, not unfortunately, and fortunately, I think we're developing increased sensitivity to some of those kinds of things. Um, one of the things is that the, and I think this came up yesterday perhaps, uh, um, a discussion about the role of the parole officer in correctional systems, or maybe that was today. Um, and the idea of um, it's not just a checklist of did they check in this week, how are things, but rather um, a, a broader role in terms of helping in terms of the readjustment to the outside world. When that role, when and if that role is redefined, it's much easier for them to play a role. But, but it also requires a different kind of parole officer and probationary officer than we typically have, have, have taught and have engaged. So one of the things is that obviously the real risk to public safety has to be taken into consideration. Um, if they were walking down the street and they went into a bar and they weren't driving a car and they didn't do anything violent and, 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 is that the same thing as being picked up for driving drunk? I think most of us would say, no, it isn't. However, they did use alcohol. So um, building into the system a sensitivity of um, the brain damage, the the lack of, so they think maybe, you know, maybe they think that they weren't supposed to drive drunk. Well, they didn't drive drunk. They got drunk, but they didn't drive drunk. So how do you, um, how do you balance those? Things? So partly we have to look at the behavior itself, the context, and the community. The community being what are the community expectations, the community standards, and how can this, um, this new parolee um, integrate more effectively. It's not how did the system fail them exactly, but it is, it is sort of a take on that which says, how do we accommodate the, the brain damage in this individual when they're not a threat to others? So we have to train more effectively and we have to provide also some alternatives in living and social environments that we often don't. Often they come back, we don't have appropriate support for them, which leads back to the uh, behavior we don't want. I don't think that exactly answered your question, but bottom line is, I don't have an answer to your question. I just found for me, like I'm not a parole officer, but I, I work in that area. I'm a social worker working with clients in the community. So for me, I, I work with a, a gentleman who I've been working with for a while with FASD, and my approach with him is I'm, ve we're very, I'm very clear and concise about my expectations. I've set up very structured kind of um, you know, things that he needs to do and we, we accomplish. I accompany him to appointment. We talk about the expectation around the appointment, the plan, and then I involve his caregivers in the, in the plan so the message is continually repeated. Right. So, it, so far we're, we're effective. So. Well, and that's exactly, that's exactly all the key elements. Um, you know, you've got the environment, you've got the caregivers, you've got a larger community, and you've got your consistency. I, wanna, I, I really want to say how important the commitment is to those of you who, who provide the clinical service on, on this front, uh, you know, on the, on the battlefield sort of a thing, because that consistency that you provide by being the person that goes with him, that explains about, that reinforces what the contingencies are is critical very, very critical. Um, you know, we keep coming back to the reality that this kind of brain damage really says, I'm not going to be able to organize information very well. I'm not going to be able to think ahead particularly well. I'm not going to be able to assess by myself the impact of my behaviors on others. Surely someone can help me. And you're doing that. And that's exactly the key, the key elements but it's awfully labor intensive. Yes. Shall we? Shall we? Shall we? 
um, look at the, the, the fact that how, how, how valid all these conditions could be when, when we know that this, this, this person has some limitation about, about I'm talking about the parole conditions, right? If we know, we know that this, this person has FASD, whatever, and then we know that his capacity, blah, 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 could be very much limited, and then we impose on him similar parole conditions as if he were a, quote, normal person. So I would say we have to go back to the, to the, to the, to the, to the origin of the whole, whole, whole part about would the judge take that into consideration and be more sensitive and be more reasonable knowing the history or background of that person? Yeah, well, we would, we would certainly hope so, you know. But that requires, and, uh, you know, it's just like, I, I feel sort of like a parrot um, in that this requires that what? We as advocates educate the judicial system um, across the board and the enforcement system about the realities of this invisible brain damage. Um, and that doesn't come easy. That does not come easy because, you know, they want to say this behavior is unacceptable. Here's the law. Here's what happens. Um, and yet we know that there are individuals who cannot strictly follow that without help. That doesn't mean they can't be law-abiding citizens and this and that and the other, but it means that they have to have a community of support. And <clears throat> I really think that um, if we go forward with the concept of redefining the parole probationary officer role, um, we'll probably have a lot of people who don't want to do that anymore and a whole lot of people who think, huh, that's a broader job than I thought it might be. Maybe that is something I would be interested in doing because it would take on a, an entirely different um, so, uh, approach and require a different set of skills. Anything else? Okay. Okay, if everyone could uh, join me in thanking Dr. Nixon. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. <clears throat> that was just excellent. And um, we. Uh, welcome to Edmonton as well. And uh, so I just wanted to let everyone know, I'll remind you to sign your attendance sheets. Um, they are left, you're absolutely right, the light here is crazy. <laughs> They're left with Aaron in the lovely pink scarf at that table in case anyone hasn't had a chance. And that's important for us so we can get you our evaluation forms. And the next session um, of the FASD video conference series is going to be held on Friday, November 6th from 3 till 5. And that'll be with Dr. Gail Andrew. And the topic will be FASD 101. So just mark your calendars for that and thanks again for sticking around and uh, and for joining us here today thanks. Thank you.